Welcome everybody. I hope you had a pleasant lunch. And um, now that we're back, I'd like to welcome you to this session, Stone Soup, Sakai plus Creative Thinking Gets the Job Done. I'm Wilma Hodges. I'll be moderating the session. Um, just a quick reminder that all the attendees are muted. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to enter them into the question box and go to webinar at any point during the presentation. Um, we will be pausing at a couple different uh, spots in the presentation to take any questions that have come in at that point. Uh, if there aren't any that have come in at that point, then we'll just kind of save them up at the end and do a little bit of Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, like all the other sessions at the conference, this one is being recorded and it will be available at a later date on the Imperio YouTube channel. So it, also if you have any questions or problems with your audio or video, feel free to enter a comment into the question area and we'll try to handle that behind the scenes. So our presenter for this session is Nancy Hill. Nancy Hill is the Director of Academic Technology Services at MD Anderson Cancer Center. She's been with MD Anderson since 2002 in roles ranging from instructional designer to project lead in the first implementation of an enterprise learning management system. Hill is passionate about the strategic use of education to improve life experience, a mission statement that is extended across careers as an educator, instructional designer, and family therapist. Brief video interviews with multiple faculty who have used Sakai at MD Anderson will also be featured within the session. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Nancy. Thanks, Wilma. And thank you all for joining our rather cryptically titled session. Hang on one second. There we go. I am Nancy Hill, and as Wilma said, I'm the Director of Academic Technology Services. I do want to extend special thanks for this presentation to Oliver Bogler, who is our Senior VP for Academic Affairs, Sean Caldwell, who's the Program Director for our Radiation Therapy Program in the School of Health Professions, Dr. Mark Pikus, who's the Instructor of Scientific English Courses um, with our Scientific Publications Group, Zira Harden, who is a program manager in our trainee and alumni affairs group. All of these folks have participated in, in uh, contributing content and graciously allowing me to, to uh, feature their sites. And also, of course, Wilma, who is working very hard to make all of this happen smoothly. So this is my crew. We are a small team within academic affairs, um, nestled inside the vast expanse that is MD Anderson. We are responsible for supporting the educational technology tools and platforms um, within the institution, including TechSmith Relay, which is our lecture capture system, iTunes U, Adobe Connect, um, many custom applications, actually, and, of course, Sakai. So as we get started, I'd like to get a sense of where you're coming from. So I'm going to attempt to use the polls tool. One second. Not sure if you can see that. Not seeing the poll quite yet. Okay, maybe I won't. Okay. <laughs> okay, so maybe we'll, we'll abandon that effort. Um, my question for the poll was to get a sense of what percentage of your Sakai sites are dedicated to traditional academic course um, offerings. And there's a specific reason I had for asking about that, but since that didn't work, we're not going to to go with that further. Here Nancy, MD I can try to launch it for you if you like. Let me go That's ahead okay. and do that. That's okay, but thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so here at MD Anderson, we are widely known for patient care and research, but actually many people are less familiar with our educational function. And in fact, people sometimes are surprised when they find that we are part of the University of Texas system. We actually offer nine degree granting programs through our very excellent School of Health Professions. We partner with the UT Health Science Centers, Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences, and confer advanced degrees um, through those two institutional components. Um, our School of Health Professions has a great reputation, and it is small by design. Um, that's a strength because it allows every student to work very closely with faculty members and with our patients. But it does make our footprint a little bit different than probably many of the institutions that are using Sakai. For example, if you take a look at these numbers, we have a little over 300 full-time students enrolled in our School of Health Professions. And just looking at that in contrast with the number of research protocols, there are over a thousand 
and the number of employees, which is 20,000. And even those numbers are dwarfed by the number of patients who visit MD Anderson every year. We have more than 120,000 folks coming here for treatment. So when you do the math, you can begin to see how we're a little bit different and you can understand why our formal academic programs sometimes have to compete with their clinical and research siblings for attention. But the good thing about that is that it means that the systems that are designed for academic programs may have some capacity to support other areas of the mission that we are all passionate about supporting. But it's a sure bet that those won't be a perfect fit because they are designed for academics. So as I was thinking about today and about the way that we get creative to stretch what we have to the max, and I'm sure many of you do, an old fable came to mind of Stone Soup. Um, if it's been a while since you read Stone Soup, I'm going to refresh your memory. So once upon a time, there was a great famine. People were so hungry that they hoarded whatever food they could find, hiding it even from their friends and neighbors. One day a visitor came to a small village. There's not a bite to eat in the whole province, he was told. Better keep moving on. Oh, I have everything I need, he said. In fact, I was thinking of making some stone soup to share with everyone. The visitor built a fire. Then he pulled a large iron cauldron from his wagon. He filled it with water and placed it over the fire. Then, with great ceremony, he drew an ordinary-looking stone from a velvet bag and dropped it into the water. Hearing the rumor of food, the villagers began to come to the square. What stone soup, they whispered to one another. The man didn't seem to hear, but he sniffed the broth and licked his lips in anticipation. He said to himself rather loudly, ah, I do like a tasty stone soup. Of course, stone soup with cabbage. Now that would be hard to beat. A villager approached, holding a cabbage he'd retrieved from its hiding place. Capital, cried the visitor. He stirred for a few moments. Then he said thoughtfully, you know, I once had stone soup with cabbage and potatoes, and it was even better. A woman left, then reappeared with a few shriveled potatoes. Splendid, the man said, adding them to the pot. As the pot bubbled, he remarked, this will be delicious. It's too bad it's that there's no salt beef. Even a bit of salt beef makes stone soup fit for a king. Another villager soon approached with scraps of salt beef. And so it went, with carrots, onions, and so on, until the cauldron was full to overflowing with a delicious smelling soup. The visitor pronounced it done and shared it with all of the villagers. They exclaimed, what wonderful soup! Who would have guessed it could be so filling, even though it just requires a stone? It must be a magic stone, said another. The visitor only smiled. So the moral of that story is often said to be about how we have more than we think we do if we just share. And that's certainly relevant with our situation and probably with many of yours. But I wonder if an even more apt moral is the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new lands, but in seeing with new eyes. So as you think about the way you use Sakai at your institution, ask yourself, am I a visitor or a villager? Education takes many forms, and learning comes in all shapes and sizes. So Sakai may be able to play a role supporting many of them, but if you need to look at your institution's needs with new eyes for that. So this is where I was going to have my second poll, but we'll just proceed because that has not been working well. So we'll just roll with it. <laughs> what does it mean to see differently? It's about thinking outside the box. Seeing differently may help you realize that you can use Sakai to do different things, like motivating students with a friendly competition simplifying and streamlining a complex process, such as applying to our highly competitive radiation therapy degree program. We'll be looking at that site in detail in a few minutes. Seeing differently allows you to use Sakai to mentor junior, junior faculty members. It may reduce ramp up time for students, trainees, and staff members who are new to your institution. Sakai is web-based and its interface is intuitive. So that can mean easier access to training for performance support tools, like attendance capture systems, addressing compliance requirements um, for mandatory review of information, resources and tutorials for lecture capture tools, the way that we use it for uh, TechSmith Relay. 
It can mean practice opportunities for professional certification exams. This is a highly popular use of Sakai at our institution. And supporting practical and professional language learning in the workplace. We'll be hearing from Dr. Mark Pikus about his scientific English classes a little later. One of the most appealing features of Sakai for us is the fact that it's open source. Since we don't have to pay a fee for every learner, it means we can share the system with external learners without the cost recovery implications. And that means we can use Sakai as a platform to share important information with the thousands of trainees that come to MD Anderson every year, sometimes even before they're on site. Um, particularly with the large number of international trainees in our graduate medical education programs, that's a huge advantage. We'll be taking a closer look at how Sakai has improved the efficiency of onboarding our trainees in just a few minutes. The open source model means we can use Sakai to share educational content from uh, the medical conferences that are sponsored by our CME group and others throughout the institution. And this refers to one of our newest initiatives, launching um, a website within Sakai that allows us to bring medical expertise to Africa. So we're going to start with our uh, deep dive by looking at this exciting new program. This is the way that, that this will work. I will show you the site, and when I've had the opportunity to talk to some of our faculty members about a few of these sites, you'll actually be able to hear them describing it in their own words. So I'm going to do a little sleight of hand here um, as I pull up the site for the GME Core Curriculum Lecture Series Excellent. And I have the, um, the type zoomed in, so it's doing some kind of strange things here, but if you'll just bear with me, I think it's going to help you to see the text better. So this is the GME, uh, or this is the core curriculum lecture series that is being offered for our um, sister institutions and as an outreach to Sub-Saharan Africa. And so the voice you'll be hearing is Dr. Oliver Bogler, our Senior VP for um, Academic Affairs, talking about this particular project and putting these uh, lectures into Sakai was his brainchild. So I'm just going to show you some of the content as Dr. Bugler describes what's here. So I would say two years ago now we formed a group of faculty with interests in Africa and connections there and discussed over this last two years what are the best projects to do, what, what is the real need in Africa. Coincident with that has been the realization at the UN and throughout the world that non-communicable diseases, particularly cancer, are becoming a growing problem for people in Africa, and that unfortunately they don't have the professional body of healthcare delivery people that they need to, to meet that blooming crisis. So together with the African Cancer Institute, which is newly formed at Stellenbosch University, and the UICC, the International Union for Cancer Control, uh, we're working on an on a, uh, educational program, a capacity building program, in sub-Saharan Africa, and we're trying to bring cancer knowledge to healthcare workers. And so this is a first step in deploying some of the existing, I would say, or ongoing educational materials that MD Anderson already produces for its own needs, in this case for educating our fellows and residents, and putting it to an additional purpose by deploying it through distance learning tools through the Sakai system. So what we're sharing is the what we call the core curriculum for the fellows, and this is a lecture series delivered on an annual rotation to all the fellows. And the idea here is that while the fellows are getting specialist education in their chosen field, you know, more in hands-on ways in the clinic and, and with their faculty mentors and so on, through this lecture series they're getting a grounding in all the other cancers, so to speak. So that makes it ideal for what we're doing in Africa because the lectures are not pitched at the high specialist sort of end. They're at the level of what should a well-rounded oncologist of any particular specialty know about these other cancers in general. The particular target here is actually our partnership uh, with the African Cancer Institute. So they have both research and, of course, also clinical education. So they educate fellows themselves. Um, and they're interested in accessing this material. But what's particularly interesting or fortuitous is that the African Cancer Institute, which is in South Africa at uh, Stellenbosch University in, uh, near Cape Town, is itself um, bringing in fellows from other African countries on an ongoing basis that come maybe for three or six months, and they will then also, when they're at Stellenbosch, they'll be able to access this material. So the reach hopefully will be further than just one location. 
you know, when we travel to Africa, what we're seeing is, is a, a practice pattern, if you will, that's really based on the fact that there just aren't many uh, oncologists and relatively few specialists within oncology. So in some countries, for example, you know, gynecological cancer care is provided by a, the same person who does all the obstetrics, and they might have a catchment area for one a physician of, you know, a million people. There is just that whole lack of capacity. There are many issues to be solved. This is just one component of, of what we're going to hope to be doing there. But I think it's a good component, and it, you know, it, it's such a nice combination of technology that we are already we're very versatile with, um, and that we are, you know, able to deploy at MD Anderson readily and uh, material that we already have. So, so as you can see, that what we've structured here is very simple, and that is intentional because um, of the limitations on the other end. But it's also a nice way to share, as Dr. Bogler said, the content, some, some expertise in medical oncology with folks that, that do not have a resource um, for this. So these are lectures that are produced for our trainees, and they've been repurposed um, on Sakai. Um, since it is web-based, since we can have external learners with access to this. And since um, these are our streaming videos, so we don't have to worry about bandwidth for downloading um, the lectures. And it's, it is one component of a larger program, but it's a particularly exciting one. So I wanted to focus on that. And that's sponsored by our Global Academic Programs Department. Another is our excellent School of Health Professions, which I've already told you a little bit about. And I talked with Sean Caldwell, the program director for this. Unfortunately, the audio for that interview did not turn out well, so you're going to hear me describing what happened with that. Sean um, talked with me about their radiation therapy application process. It's a highly competitive program, um, but what they found was that the students that were applying to the program to be admitted, we're asking the same questions and running into the same confusing points over and over. I'm going to show you that site in just a minute, but part of the problem, and Sean knew this, was that there are so many pieces to the application process. The students have to have interviews, they have to submit transcripts, which is a fairly common thing, but they also have a fair number of other requirements that they have to meet to apply to this program. So the staff, um, the coordinators, the instructors, they're all the same folks. We're getting question after question, um, the same questions over and over. So Sean and I got together and talked about, this is Sean, um, the best way to construct this. We put this inside Sakai, but they really wanted this to be open with, with no registration. They didn't even want um, something as simple as a joinable site. They didn't want the, the students to have to do that. So this needed to be a public URL with no registration, um, no barriers whatsoever, because they really wanted the applicants to walk through this site. So let me go back to my web browser. And what we did uh, was we got together and we built this site. It's inside Sakai. The student never actually sees this interface that you're looking at. The URL goes straight to here. And we talked about what's going to motivate somebody to actually go to this. And for the application process, it's getting in, being accepted. So we returned it as how to win at the application process, and we built it around this metaphor um, of NASCAR. I had to consult with my NASCAR buddies about this because I know nothing about NASCAR. Um, but Sean had felt that video clips would be something that the students would get much more out of. So after we organized all the information and we divided it into natural phases, we built these video clips of Sean actually talking about uh, what's needed, what happens. I'm going to mute it because I don't think that will be good quality. But he basically addresses the most commonly um, encountered questions and walks them through and also gives them tips for how to be successful in the process. We did this very simply, no budget, uh, did the video, you can kind of tell that we did the editing ourselves, but it was very successful. And when I talked to Sean um, in the interview about this, about you know, how, how is it going, because it's a couple years out, he said that the questions have dropped to nearly zero. And even though we had constructed a way to be incentivizing the students to, to access this website before they came, he said that hasn't been necessary, um, that he finds when they 
get to the interview process, all of them have been to the website. So that certainly made us feel very good. And again, it doesn't really look like a Sakai site, doesn't necessarily behave the same way as a Sakai site, um, but it's literally taking advantage of the interface that's within Sakai. Um, we returned the tests and quizzes tool as a guest book, and we have a way for the students to sign in there and, and get that little freebie for accessing the site, but as I said, it turns out that they didn't need it, so that, that definitely met their needs. So Training in Alumni Affairs has more than 6,000 trainees that come in every year, and this creates a number of challenges in terms of the learning space to process those folks, scheduling, and accessing systems, because until they come on board, they don't have credentials to get into um, into the, the VPN, into the, the network. So in talking with um, the folks within Training and Alumni Affairs, which is within our um, larger group of administrative and visa affairs, we talked about the pre-orientation and orientation needs for these trainees. So you're going to hear from um, Zero Harden, who's a program manager within Training and Alumni Affairs, and I'm going to show you um, the orientation and the pre-orientation sites that we've set up to assist these folks. Currently, right now, we're processing maybe about 3,000 a year, and that includes research, clinical, those who are non-scientific, rotating trainees, they come for a month and then they go back to their home institution. They all have to do orientation. They were hard to pin down because there was no mechanism that would fit with their schedule because they, you know, weren't able to do the the orientation face to face because they because of their time schedules. Because these are actual doctors with the new online Sakai. I mean, they can take that orientation anyway because you're able to log in online. You don't have to be here. You don't have to be signed up. And people stop. It, you know, because the, the separation really makes it more efficient and it's convenient. And they're able to do it before they get here. I would say it's um. The, a 180 turnaround. I mean, I think we, uh, right now I can comfortably say that we probably have an 85, 90% compliant. It's, it's wonderful. Currently, right now. So as you can see, once again, we really streamlined what's in there. Uh, with this group, they need to get the compliance um, requirements out of the way as quickly as possible. Um, what they were completing was an employee module that is based on retaining folks wasn't even applicable to their needs most of the time. One thing that we were able to do as well that we were very excited about was linking with um, benefits. With benefits information, this is something that they get many, many questions about. And really, these are pointers to um, public pages on the UT system. But they were being so flooded by information that this was a nice way to organize it. And again, this is just web content link within Sakai. Not rocket science. It's just thinking about it a little bit differently so that we were able to, to meet their needs with it. Um, and as you heard Zira say, their compliance rates have gone from very, very low. <laughs> Institutional compliance was not happy to um, 85 to 90 percent of the rotators, the trainees, the residents, the fellows are able to complete these requirements and that is important because um, it is a mandatory module for them and they get the information that they need ahead of time and they get it um, in a timely fashion, making good and efficient use of their time. So scientific publications is an interesting group. It, it is um, English language learning with a slightly different spin. And you're going to be hearing from uh, Dr. Mark Pikus, let me get that queued up, about what he does. And this one's a little different. I am going to show you the site, but I'm going to show you some of his materials. He, um, he does face-to-face -face courses and he uses Sakai to support what he is doing. So it may be a little more familiar in terms of the format. Um, it may be a little more relevant to your academic courses the way that, that those are typically done, but I think you'll see it's a very interesting example of creative use of Sakai, and Mark was actually um, our very first pilot user. He, uh, six, seven years ago when we brought Sakai Live, he was our very first user. He was using um, a beta site in dev uh, <laughs> because he needed this so badly for, for his group, so we're, we're very pleased to include Mark in 
in this. So let me get back to, oh, he's under more. Okay. My classes are for non-native speakers of English who are here at the institution, whether they're citizens or residents, so they're permanent employees or postdocs here for a limited amount of time, or a lot of visitors who are maybe here for a year or a year and a half to do some research related to what they're doing in their home, at their home institution. English is the international language of science and very much so of biomedical science. So all of these people have to publish in English and they have to present in English. They also hopefully want to communicate on a day-to-day -day business, day-to-day, <laughs> -day, you know, purposes in English with Sakai. I use it to a great extent as course management because it's a very convenient way to get materials to the students. There's no textbooks. All the materials we use in the class, and when I say all, I mean all, are teacher developed. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've got a lot of documents and I have a lot of links to things on PubMed and I'm not going to spend my time making copies for everybody in class and remembering to haul them. With Sakai, it's there, and when it's time for a new unit, I make it available to them, and I just send them an email. But then if I change something, if I upload something new, the website will send out the emails automatically with that, the notifications, yeah. In the conversation classes and in the writing classes, I put students in groups so that they're looking at different articles in the writing classes. Actually, in conversations, we do some work with shorter, more general kinds of articles. And so I'll put them in, in groups so that they only have access to the article I want them to look at. Then, like if they have to make a presentation in class, a short little talk to the rest of the class about their article. The other ones haven't seen it before. so it's, I have four different kinds of classes. I actually have three pronunciation classes in which we practice various aspects of pronunciation. I have two conversation classes. One is focused on personal conversations. So this is like, what do you say when your colleague comes in in the morning and says, what's up? Or, and then the other one is workplace conversations, which is like, how can you, you know, when you're at a meeting, a lab meeting, and you need to express your opinion, or you need to make a request, or you need to complain about something, how do you do that in a culturally appropriate and hopefully grammatically more or less correct way? And a lot of times, they might be asking something very, very basic and using way too formal language, which is usually not a problem, but it could result in eye rolling you know, or something. I, 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 my goal is to make sure nobody rolls their eyes when you speak English. There are a billion different ways to make a request in many languages, but, you know, and sometimes a request that we make it doesn't sound like a request. Like we may come in and sit down in a meeting and say, does anybody have a pen? And you're not asking, does anybody have a pen? You're asking, does someone have a pen that they can lend me or give me for the duration of the meeting? So sometimes they just have to understand that. And like in the pronunciation, one of the pronunciation classes where we talk about intonation, I teach them sarcastic intonation. You know, so if someone comes up to you and says, you are the man for that job. <laughs> no, that's nice hair. You know, a nice haircut. That means it's a nice haircut. But if somebody comes up to you and goes, nice haircut, you know, you have to know not to say, oh, thanks. You know, I spent a lot of money. In it. You know, but you have to understand it, even if you hear somebody saying it. So obviously, uh, Dr. Pikus is delightful and um, has been extremely creative in the ways that he is is helping our trainees, but also some faculty members. He, he told me that there are a fair number of staff and faculty that also will take some of his, his courses with very practical skills. These are folks that are highly fluent in written English and understanding English, but some of the more subtle nuances that you and I probably take for granted um, are not things that they 
are, have had an opportunity to really learn, and yet they may impact their professional career. I wanted to show you one of the things that I was prowling around on his sites because I wanted to see uh, what documents I could show you since, as he mentioned, it's heavily Word-based, Excel-based. And I found this and contacted Mark, who, as you can tell, is a lot of fun, and said, okay, this looks like it has an interesting story. And he said, oh, yes, I forgot about that, and, and was explaining to me that if you look at column A here, um, and I'm zoom this so that you can read the type. Let me zoom in a little more because I really want you to, to be able to see this. I thought this was great. Okay. Um, if you look at column A, these are common expressions that you and I talk about, kind of like the, does anyone have a pen? And never really think. Um, and then if you look in column I, these are common ways that it might be expressed by someone that is not as uh, familiar with American use of English, um, and that kind of makes them stand out a bit and may be uncomfortable. The numbers in the middle, I asked him about that. He said that has to do with he asks the students, remember these are face-to-face -face courses as well as the materials they have online, how often they've encountered these or how often they've used them. What's their estimate of how often they've used them? And he said sometimes he'll, he'll actually ask them to kind of track that as well. But looking down through here, it makes perfect sense uh, that thank you for looking at me, we would assume, you know, if, if that was not something we were familiar with, that that's the same as thank you for seeing me. Um, nice to introduce you. It's just, it's very interesting to, to look at these, these different things and uh, gives us a whole different level of sympathy too for, for folks that try and, and cope with our very complex language. Um, but Mark has been, as I said, one of our very earliest in terms of, of users. Um, as I was mentioning to as I was mentioning to Wilma, um, we also, in addition to the radiation therapy program using Sakai for the um, streamlining the process of application, we have a um, School of Health Professions interdisciplinary case um, conference group. Um, it's that cuts across all the different departments, and they actually were the recipients of a Twizia Award for Innovative Use of Sakai. So we do tend to bend it um, to do what we need. This is one particular um, aspect, and actually Mark's group does use this. This is something that my team put together called um, MC Appster, and I get a lot of grief that that's a kind of dated title, but that's what it is, a play on MC Hammer, and it is an app and it's multiple choice, so that's where that came from. This is designed to allow students to be able to compete, but in a way that lets them save face. You can imagine that medical residents and trainees are somewhat competitive, and they also care very much about having the right answer when they're in front of, of uh, their peers, and that's not unique to them, of course, all of us do. No, no one likes to look foolish. So we created this game, and it is works with the LTI function in Sakai. Actually, let me pull up, he has one in his site, so let me pull that up. I think it's in conversation too, yeah. Um, the scoreboard, as you'll see, there isn't much in there right now. Oh, and I need to create an alias so you can see how, how this is done. When the student first logs in, I'm logged in as a student, they're asked to create an alias, and this is mapped to their login then they can be, you know, Legal Eagle or Java Man or whatever they like and assume that identity, take the test, and when they come back to the scoreboard, it's going to have that listed. You can see I haven't taken the test yet, but there's this nice little cool application and for just the tests that are marked with the metadata, um, for MC Appster, it will capture those scores and they can compete against one another. So this is something that my team developed. Um, Rusty Manasia, who you saw on the first slide, uh, Colin Sweeney and I worked on this and it's used by one of our GME groups for um, the Hematology Oncology Fellowship. It's also used by Dr. Pikus with um, some of his classes and some other folks have, have tried it too, but um, it's just a nice low pressure, fun way for them to compete. And again, not using anything um, that's not terribly straightforward, but just thinking about it a little more creatively. So, 
these are some of our other kinds of things, and you may be doing some of these things as well. I noticed um, just in the list of presentations, it looks like we've got some creative folks out there. We use Sakai for IT tool training. We use it, as you saw, for several different mentoring programs. Uh, we have a dedicated site for each of our GME programs with just their specific materials and links to the sites that they need. Our continuing medical education group uses it as a repository for their educational conference materials. So the lack of um, a seat license is very freeing and just thinking about the ability to use it to meet all these different institutional needs because they're all related to education, they're all related to process improvement, but they may not be the traditional way that, that we might be tempted to think of, of Sakai. So that's our version of Stone Soup, and, and I would like to hear your questions and how you might be using Sakai in, um, in your, your institution. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. The first one is, how do you arrange the groups in Sakai? How do we arrange the groups in Sakai? We use the standard um, tools for arranging the groups. I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly. I mean, with creating the groups, managing the groups, um, in terms of the different uh, professional groups, each of them gets a, a site, a dedicated site. So if that was the, the question, what it was referring to, uh, we do create a site for each of those. Okay. And how is the scoreboard app tied in to the test and quizzes tool? The scoreboard app is tied into, and please call it MC Appster. Someone else besides oh, me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> how does MC Appster tie in to the test and quizzes tool? The way that that works is within the test and quizzes um, settings, there's a field for metadata. And so we have set up a system where we put um, a keyword in there. Uh, in the keyword metadata field, and that instructs the application that Rusty Manasia on my team built and through the LTI feature to pull just those uh, test scores. And then it has the function of uh, compiling the test scores, averaging, and that sort of thing as well. Okay, oh, and we had a clarification posted on that group question. I believe um, they were interested in the discussion groups the discussion groups around we we do use discussion groups to some point and or it may be talking about Mark's classes possibly um, yeah it could yes. be um, sorry and the one that Mark referred to he definitely uses the forum tool um, for some discussion groups what he's found is um, He's actually, he's, as you can tell, he's an early adopter, so he's tried a, a great number of tools, and right now we're looking at him, um, at him integrating VoiceThread, a pilot with VoiceThread for his, for his group. But the discussion groups, um, some are done offline, some are done online. Um, the online one uses the standard forum tool, and typically the, the prompt is something like, um, you know, describe a, a situation in which you were unsure what someone meant or um, a situation where you spoke what you thought was appropriate and it turned out you were understood differently or that sort of thing. Okay. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, thank you. Um, have you looked at the challenges of keeping attendance or other forms of accountability? You know, when you're using it for the professional folks, it, there's a wide range. It's a great question. There's a wide range of attendance needs. Sometimes it's just for information and resources, and they don't care about taking attendance. Um, sometimes they do want to take attendance, as I was mentioning with uh, Sean's site for streamlining the application process. They would like to see how many uh, students hit that site just to see for usefulness, but they also would like to keep track. They thought at first they were going to need to keep track so that they could provide incentives for people to watch the videos, get the information, and not have the steady stream of questions. That has not been necessary, but the way that we addressed that was we created, um, within the Tests and Quizzes tool, we created an open-ended test without a score, and we made it publicly available and embedded the URL. And every question was like a short essay question, and we would ask them things, or, or um, a multiple choice, and everything was marked as correct. Uh, we do that sometimes. And, so the multiple choice might be 
uh, what type of applicant are you? Have you finished this? Or are you coming? You have a bachelor's degree, you have a high school degree, you have an associate's degree, that sort of thing, and there are no wrong answers. Um, so when they sign the guest book, we had a few things like that for them to do, and they enter their name and their email address, and that's used for follow-up. But Sean told me that that really has not, people sign the guest book at the end, but that has not been an issue for them. For others, if they want to make sure that they have um, completed it, we do have the certificate, um, the Cer Sakai certificate, and we use conditional release, adaptive release for that with a few things, like with the institutional orientation. We pull test scores from those as well and feed that into our uh, system of record for, um, for completions. Uh, we also use the statistics tool, frankly, to track the number of downloads if they're just interested in, okay, are people actually using this? That is more true with the GME sites, where they're mostly resources, but they want to see what the trainees are actually hitting to um, assess their interest and see what else they want to put there. So they use the statistics tool to see which resources have been downloaded. Um, and we also put the web links within the resources area because then those can be tracked as well. So lots of different ways um, beyond the traditional attendance. Great. Um, we have a question about video streaming. They want, would like to know what you use for live streaming video. My department actually um, supports the streaming media for the institution and we strongly encourage, I'm not going to say prohibit, but we strongly encourage everyone that uses Sakai to um, embed a link rather than to download audio or video files for all the usual reasons. So we use Adobe Media Server for um, our streaming service. We also have um, a live media service that we support for the institution, but Adobe, Adobe Media Server is, is the, the uh, system for both of those. Great. And um, someone would like to know if you've thought of adding badges to the MC Appster tool. <laughs> that is something we had not thought about. Honestly, I would just like to see more people use it. I think that knowing the people at MD Anderson as I do, I think you throw a little bit of competition and a game kind of thing into just about anything, um, and you get people much more motivated, even if there are no prizes and there's no payoff. And um, so I, I talk about that application quite a bit. It's there for people to use. It just it takes a little bit of time on the part of the instructors, and frankly, they're all just as stretched as we are. So I'd love to see that more widely used. And if badges would make that happen, um, you know, we'd certainly be open to to that. Great. Um, well, we've got about three minutes left. Um, we have one more question that was just posted so if you have another anyone else in the audience has another quick question we can probably take maybe one or two more questions um, before we need to close up uh, the one that just came in is the is the AMC Abster course specific or can it be used across the platform it can be used it's a great question it can be used across the platform um, it's LTI it's available we have to do a tiny bit of configuration on our side um, when someone lets us know. It is built to be integrated with our own authentication, so it isn't something, we, we actually looked at the possibility of sharing it with the community, um, and it looks like because big pieces of it are custom built on our side that that would be kind of tough to do, but definitely the concept is there, and LTI works very well for us um, with that. And it is available for any of the courses that are in Sakai. Anything that has a test can be with very simple configuration can be set up to use that. Great. Okay, any last questions before we wrap up? Okay, I'm not seeing anything new, so um, if you have any closing thoughts, Nancy? Just, as I said, I, none of this is rocket science, but I, I really think that Sakai is a great resource, and, I, and when I talk to people about it, um, because we do have an enterprise system for corporate training, and this is an academic platform, but not thinking of it as an academic platform, thinking of it just as the different features and the functionalities and how they can support learning in general, I think has been very powerful for us. And folks are often surprised when we talk about it, and typically the way we approach that is when we go in, 
we don't say, here's what we have, here's the tool. We go in and we say, what are you trying to do? You know, what, what are you trying to accomplish? And let us think about how maybe the tools and systems we have might be able to get you there. That is very enjoyable. It's kind of like a puzzle, and I love puzzles. Um, and people are often surprised, whereas if you go in and you just say, here's what we have, here are the tools, it's, it's not their area of expertise. They don't necessarily think that way. And so they may say, no, that's not going to meet our needs. So it's you thinking differently, and it's also helping others think differently. Great. Well, thank you very much, Nancy, for a wonderful presentation. I'm glad we got a chance to see um, some of what you guys are doing at MD Anderson. It's, it's, um, you're doing some really creative stuff, so that's always great to see. Um, and uh, I, again, uh, I thank everyone for attending, and I encourage you to you know, shuffle on over to the next session, um, which will be starting in just a few moments. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.